Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 this morning. You can say amen when you're there. Amen. Uh, this is one of those, it's a sermon that I preached um, last year in August, but it's one of those um, um, sermons that you, as a pastor, you know you have to preach this at least once or twice in a year to your congregation so that they can have an edge or something um, in their life to continue to keep on going in life. Ephesians 6 verse 12, recently National Geographic ran an article about the Alaskan bull moose. Um, the males of the species battle for dominance during the fall um, breeding season, literally going head to head with antlers crushing together as they collide. If you can just picture this in your mind, it's just these uh, moose go, coming together, just hitting, and they, they uh, it's, it's literally a turf war. They, they want to be the biggest ones, and the ones with the biggest antlers, and they hit each other, colliding. The heftiest moose with the largest and strongest antler triumphs. Therefore, the battle fought in the fall is really won during the summer. I want you guys to pay attention here. The biggest moose, the one with the largest antler, is the one that wins. Therefore, the battle that's fought in fall is really one during the summer when he prepares for this battle. When the moose eats continually, bulks up on the calories that he needs, and bulks up on all the protein and different stuff that he needs to take in so that he can grow and continue to grow. It simply comes down to this. The one that consumes the best diet for growing antlers and gaining weight will be the heavyweight in that fight. Those that eat inadequately sport weaker antlers, less bulk, and when fall comes, lose dominance. There's a lesson here for us, church. And that is that in our life, there's constantly going to be spiritual battles. Battles. And maybe this morning you are in your summer. That you're not specifically going through something where you feel like you're contending or you're, you're colliding with things. But can I tell you this morning that your day will come. Amen. That Satan will choose a season to attack. There's going to be a strategy or there's going to be strategic planning against your life. And somewhere you have to treat your life like it's summer and you have to bulk up. You have to have an adequate diet so that when those times come, you have the largest antler. Antlers. See, we will be victorious when we consider our summer. We'll be victorious in our fall when we consider our summer. Much depends on what we do when the war before the war begins. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says it like this. It says, For we do not wrestle against, we do not wrestle against flesh uh, and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. I want to preach a sermon that I've entitled, Learning How to Wrestle, this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place, God. God, I pray that you will, God, touch your people's heart, God, that you will touch us, be here with us, presence, God. God, I pray that you will um, continue to help us, Father, grow in Christianity. God, understand that there are battles that we will face, Father, and that our services Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, our Bible study are simply just created so that we can have an adequate diet, God, for I'm with you, God, so when those days will come in our life, Father, we can support the largest antlers that you can give us, God. We trust in you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say this morning, Amen. I want to start off with my first point, and that is the curse of passiveness. Christianity is a religion of power. Christianity is not a sissified uh, religion. It's not supposed to bring a man or bring him down to a level of weakness. Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. 
Throughout the Bible, we see God and a people of God who waged war to preserve righteousness and holiness. You begin to study the book of Judges and the book of Numbers, and you see just the conquest of the people of God and all the wars and the, the bloodshed and all these different things, the, 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 the struggle and, you know, just trying to uh, conquer what, they, what God has given them. Christianity has an aggressive nature. But see, I believe that somewhere there's been a strategy straight from hell that has attacked this very nature of who we are as Christians. You know, you begin to look at these mega churches and these um, these preachers and you begin to just see it's almost like a hyper grace movement, just Mr. Nice Guy and always smiling and you know, just just the champion in you type of mentality, and it's all about you. You begin to look at uh, the the most the more recent uh, books when it comes down to Christian Christian books. There's mainly stuff on diets and what's the Christian way to uh, to lose weight and how how to be nice and all these different uh, um, things that you see. And, and listen, there's a place for kindness and there's a place for uh, for social skills and. Being a likable person, but can I tell you this morning that throughout your life you're gonna have to learn how to be aggressive. Amen. Amen. Society likes to sophisticate and pacify Christianity. And throughout the Bible, you never saw sophistication or a, or, or a Christianity be pacified. Can I tell you this morning there is no room for passiveness? This word passive by definition means receiving. Or subjected to an action without responding, responding, or initiating an action in return. The mind viewed as a passive receptacle for sensory experience. In other words, you just receive what's given to you. So that's just what I'm going to do. I'm just for the rest of my life. I'm just going to just take the, the hits that the devil gives me, and that's just how my marriage is going to be. I might not love my wife the whole way, but it's okay. And you begin to think these things, you know, and somewhere it's just settled in, in your mind. And this is kind of what, what happens uh, in, in just the, um, the church world. You begin to see just the attacks and, uh, and just of being passive. Matthew 10, 16, it says, Behold, I send, out, send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Somewhere there needs to be a balance. That yes, you need to be harmless, and yes, your intention doesn't need to be evil, and somewhere you're not trying to hurt people. That's not what I'm saying this morning. But at the same time, you need to be wise, and you can't be walked all, 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 all upon. You can't just take in stuff that people do to you. you somewhere you have to have an aggressive spirit. Amen. This is true for the church when it comes down to evangelism. You can either settle for what the devil has for your city, or you can fight for the plans that God has for your town. See, Jesus is reminding us that in the eyes of the enemy, we are prey. See, a lot of times we forget this. Amen. We forget that, you know what, that somewhere there's an enemy that does not like us. You guys read enemies in life? Amen. You don't sit down and drink a cup of tea with your enemies. Amen. You don't sit down and discuss your plans in life with your enemies. Amen. You don't sit down and begin to fellowship with them because somewhere you understand there's an evil intention from your enemies. And it's the very same thing when it comes down to our spiritual life is that you see many Christians sit down and fellowship and have this communion with the darkness. And we know what the Bible says that what business does light have to do with the darkness? Amen. See, the devil wants to see you defeated. It's a term. It's called American, American civil religion, which are the elements of cultural and political life that connects to a higher purpose and meaning, often bonding the people of a nation together. I understand it sounds nice and, and, and flowery, amen, that we can, uh, that we can uh, all hold hands and, and sing God bless America, you know, that we can somewhere have some type of patriotism to our nation because we're founded on Christian Judeo um, values and somewhere, listen, there's a place for that. And I love the fact, I mean, if you guys know that America is the best nation in the world. Amen. And I understand that. But if you're not careful, you can justify your Christianity by getting involved in this. Somewhere you begin to justify your salvation because you're a Republican. Somewhere you begin to justify, you know, who you are as a Christian because 
You just simply attend church or this is what we do as Americans and the majority are Christians. And somewhere you begin to allow this mindset to, to, um, to just set its ways in your, in your life. See, when you were born into the kingdom, you were born a warrior. See, there was a time in Christianity where this was like, this was huge. You're like, oh, you enlisting in God's army. You know, it's just, you know, somewhere like you're like, oh, you're a soldier for Jesus. You know, and it was just, it, you know, it was just some, something that was cool. Very militant mindset. Can I tell you, listen, you can't, you can't strive, you can't walk too far away from that. I understand there's extremes, but there, there does need to be a militant mindset. There, there is a very, there is very much a truth throughout the Bible that there are things that you need to be aggressive about. Amen. There are things that you, you, you can't take no for an answer. And you have to fight for these things. And this is something that as you're born, born again as a Christian, it's something that should be instilled in your mind from your church, your, your pastor, your leaders, from reading your word of God. Somewhere you should catch this revelation that you know what, that this wasn't passive. Throughout the ministry, you saw Jesus Christ push aggressively against all the things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees believed in. All these things you see John the Baptist call the Pharisees brood of vipers. And you see Jesus begin to give them complaints about the book of Isaiah. How you worship with your hands and your mouth, but your heart is far from me. Those, was, uh, those were aggressive things. Yeah. Jesus, the loving, uh, the loving son of God that came to save us. You know the story, walks into the temple and sees men and women gambling with money there and selling things. And he begins to flip over the tables and it's very aggressive. Amen. Can I tell you parents, if you want your child to serve God in this generation, you're going to have to be aggressive. Amen. You're going to have to make decisions that other people don't. There's certain things that, you know, Brandon watches that other kids don't and vice versa. There's certain things that he doesn't watch. Even though it might sound okay. Although it might sound like it's something that, that you know what, that he could, but some of we made decisions. Yeah. No, you're, you're outreaching. I was telling him Saturday morning, I was like, because he told me that he would be able to pass out flyers. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, listen, you're working for God. Like you're, you're laboring for God. I told him, get used to it, man. It's going to be every Saturday for the rest of your life. <laughs> so you, you have to set some standards and be aggressive. You know, you tell that to anybody, you tell that to a liberal couple or a liberal person, like, oh, that's not right. You got to let them think. <laughs> you got you, you to let them, what, what does he feel? <laughs> no, what, what, how, do you, how, how do you make him feel like that? You know, somewhere, listen, if, if you're ruled by your emotions, you're going to end up in a very tough spot. You were born a warrior in the kingdom of God. There is a war going out, going on around us, and neutrality does not guarantee salvation. In this fight, we have no choice but to get involved. See, if you don't get involved, wickedness will overpower. There's a quote that says, all that it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. See, people depend on your fight this morning, father, mother, Listen, your children depend on if you're going to fight for, uh, for, for righteousness, if you're going to make decisions to, to uh, have standards in your home and go against the, uh, the crowd and the waves and all these false doctrines and all these things. Listen, people depend if you're gonna, on, on your fights. See, my question to you, Christian, this morning is if you don't fight for them, then who will? Your family, your church, your friends. See, if you don't reach out to them, then who will? No. See, the problem is that we, we like to we like to think that that the devil just comes around with a pitchfork. We were talking about this in uh, um, in Tuesday night's uh, new conference class. That we like to think that the devil is going to announce to everybody like I'm the devil, and I'm here because I, I have it against that person. <laughs> no, the Bible says that he comes like an angel of light. There's a deception involved in this. And a lot of times we think that it's it's only the evil, you know, just this is gross and evil. This is the stuff that we're going to do. Some of it is clothed in religion. Come on. Some of it is clothed and just, you know, just uh, there's a line in one of the, um, uh, just a Christian rap song. And he speaks about Disney being pure and he, it's a wordplay on there. But some of what he's saying is that, listen, just because it says Disney, it doesn't mean it's pure. Mm -hmm. And somewhere you have to make decisions and understand there are strategies against you, your family, 
And you just can't be passive anymore. I want to move on to my second thought, and that is the unorthodox defeat. This word unorthodox means contrary to what is usual, traditional, or accepted, not orthodox. And our scripture defeat is not what we think it is. Our scripture is identifying the fight that we are in. See, Paul is bringing clarity to Christians in what we are involved in. In how we prepare for it. He's telling the Ephesians in chapter 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, you're, pun you're punching the wrong guy. You're fighting with the wrong person. It says, but this is what you're fighting against. Against principalities. Against powers. Um, against rulers of the darkness of this age. Or cosmic powers. Against the spiritual host of wickedness. In the heavenly places. One of the biggest um, truths in, in life. Is that if you're going to get in a fight. you got to get in a fight with the right person. Yeah. This is why you go around. Remember in high school, you were, are you talking mess about me? Who was it? What, was it you? And you begin to, you, you identify who is the person. And this is true in spiritual life. Is that you don't fight against people. You have to understand that the fight isn't against a face, but it is, it is spiritual. And there is a wicked um, uh, spiritual realm that is against us. So my intention this morning is I want to, Try to help a little bit more as far as defining what the spiritual warfare is. What spiritual warfare is not. And this is what you're not, uh, or, or what is it, what does spiritual warfare look like? Or what does is, what is a Christian look like when he's fighting spiritually? A Christian who is singing the national anthem doesn't mean that they're fighting the spiritual warfare. A Christian who gets involved in a passionate political Debate doesn't mean that he's on the front lines of Christianity. Somebody that goes to church religiously doesn't mean that, that, that they're fighting the spiritual warfare. See, somewhere you have to understand it goes beyond just simple things that we do. Defeat here is when we are fighting the wrong fights. That is what defeat is in our scripture. It's not necessarily that you got that you're being uh, that, that, that somewhere they're killing you or, or just the regular defeat. The defeat in our scripture that Apostle Paul is speaking about is simply you are in the wrong fight. You're fighting against the wrong enemy. See, there are many Christians fighting the wrong battles. They are fighting physically. They are fighting against the church. They're fighting against their families, their, their brothers, their sisters. Fighting the wrong battles has negative effects to our lives. And this is what he's talking, this is what he's telling the, the Ephesians. He says, this is what the battle is about. Not flesh and blood, not your brother, not your sister, but it is against spirit, spiritual matters. See, fighting the wrong battle will cause you to do some negative things. One, it will cause you to waste time. I mean, guys, time, time Amen. is of essence. Amen. It's just, it, time is like gold. And if you spend so much time fighting against flesh and blood, listen, you're going to waste it. You're getting nowhere. A lot of times on this very same thing about time, you're set back on your destiny. When you, when you, should, when you should be serving God and when you should be fighting on the front lines of spiritual warfare, listen, you're, you're wasting it on flesh and blood. Many times you compromise in vital spiritual areas. When you should be talking to God in prayer and you should be outreaching, evangelizing and telling people about Jesus Christ, you're doing all these other things, all these programs in Christianity, all, all these stuff, reading all these kinds of different books that, you know, and, and all these things. There's so many things you can waste your time on. Amen. I want to say this this morning. If Satan can isolate you from God and his people, he knows he can win. Mm -hmm. Isolation is the name of his game. If he can steal your devotion from God, isolate you from God. If he can steal your fellowship and begin to add strife to you in your church and begin to twist your views of how you see people. Can I just put it out there? I'm just going to set a standard for our church. People are jacked up, okay? <laughs> people are coming in with the issues. They have different views. They're going to do things different than you. Than you. And somewhere you just have to set that in your mind. They might say things that you that you think they're against you, but in reality they're not. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. 
If he can steal your devotion, he doesn't need you to be an evil person in this world. See, you know, guys, the, the devil isn't necessarily trying to make you a murderer. He's not trying to make the next Ted Bundy out of you. But see, if he can just steal your devotion from, from God, if he can just make you view your church differently or view the Bible differently, then somewhere he has won the battle. You're going to have to be able to identify this. Somewhere you're going to have to be able to learn how to wrestle. Which takes me to my third thought, and I want to close with this. See, the strategy for our win is to get God involved before the battle begins. Amen. We need to make our match a handicap match. How many of you guys ever watched wrestling growing up? Amen. No? WWE? No. WWF? <laughs> Mexican wrestling? Rey Mysterio, come on. <laughs> so there's, there, there's, there's, a, there's a type of fight. There's all kinds of, there's cage matches, there's, there's um, the ones where you get tables and ladders involved, and there's all kinds of stuff. But there's one specifically called a handicap match. And that is when there's two versus one, or three versus two. But one of them has an, uh, an, um, a, a winning edge, or one of them has just more a, an extra person, which makes it a handicap match. A handicap match is a match where one wrestler or a team competes a team against a team of wrestlers with a higher number. Two against one, three against two. You see, somewhere, Christian, this is how you have to designate your fight right here. Is that when you walk into your spiritual uh, battles and stuff, you have to dictate it. This is going to be a handicap match. I have God with me. You know, I'm going to get God involved. And somewhere you need to uh, designate this in your mind from the beginning. It's the idea of this bull that is about to, he knows that fall is coming. He knows that somewhere he's going to have to establish dominion and establish dominance against all the other bulls. So what does he do? He begins to bulk up and he begins to work harder during the summer because during the fall, he knows I'm going to need something a little bit more than the next person. And it is exactly what a Christian does. Is that when you come to Sunday morning services, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you begin to bulk up. You begin to designate time in your in your daily life, like you wake up in the mornings and pray. Amen. You open your Bible and you get to know God by His Word. You begin to bulk up, get God involved. So whenever Satan comes and hell comes against you, your family, your friends, your church, you have the bigger antlers. This is a handicap match. You say God is involved. You can come and fight me, but God is, is with me and we're going to win. Amen. See, the crazy thing about this was that, and I know wrestling has, has um, all the drama and all the plots and all, this, all these different things that's involved. But going into a handicap match, you see two against one. What do you think? They're going to win. Amen. They're just going to win. And I understand it has this plot twist and there's always you know, the one guy that gets slapped and ends up dying on the on the ring, and then so he's, he's not involved anymore, or whatever. But you begin to see the just the strategies between this, uh, between the be, in, in this match, and one of the strategies was to isolate them. You know, you begin to just kind of back up to your corner, and one of them has to go this way, and you, and then you switch to, and now he's over here, so you can get this one by himself. And it's almost a nice, and it's, you see this throughout, you know, just in fighting, in fighting in general, the guerrilla tactics. The idea is that you can hide somewhere, and then. Catch somebody off guard. Again, in wrestling, in tag teaming, one of the ways to do it is you begin to try to isolate him far from his teammates. Same idea in basketball. You begin to double, double team and you, you create traps for people so that, they, so that they can be isolated from their team. Over this morning, I wonder, if you've allowed yourself to be isolated from God, or this morning, if the devil has you in a trap, you know, you're trying to serve God, but he's just in your face, just, you know, he's, he's all doing all these things and all these strategies to keep you away. And, and some of this stuff is practical. I mean, you want to wake up early to pray, go to sleep early. Make some coffee. Amen. Add an extra shot, do something, you know, like, just make it happen. And somewhere, some of it, it becomes very practical, but you have to make up your mind. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get God involved. You know this. You know this. This. This whole game of weight loss is very practical. There's nothing spiritual behind it. Okay. It's just you have to work out more than what you eat. Amen. <laughs> Whatever you consume from calories, you have to burn it more. 
You know, it's, it's as simple as, as, as that. And so you just have to make up your mind. This is what I'm going to, this is the way I'm going to eat. This is what I, you know, they say that one of the, the reasons why most people don't, don't, uh, don't do well on weight loss is because they don't meal prep. It's because they don't prep their food and somewhere they, they say, okay, I'm going to eat well, but then they didn't cook. So the fastest thing is Taco Bell. So they think, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go for a chalupa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and somewhere, listen, it's because of lack of preparation. Let me think about the smooth again. The smooth makes a decision. You know what? I'm going to bulk up. Amen. I'm, I'm going to do what I need to do. And somewhere, you know, the name of the game, what ends up happening is that the person who doesn't stick to the plan, the person who doesn't give them something in devotion, is the one that finds himself in trouble. Am I making sense tonight or this morning? Amen. See, the power of God and the Holy Spirit neutralizes hell. Not only does it neutralize it, but it overpowers it. The Spirit of God has the power to break any yoke in your life. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 20. I'm sorry, 10. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. It says, In the day his burden will depart from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken um, because of what? The anointing, the anointing oil, your ESV version says the fact. You know, the idea of this is, is a reference of is the anointing oil is reference to the power of God. Throughout the Bible, you saw that an anointing, what this meant was that it was separated from, that that person or whatever they were anointing was separated for God. You see this when the prophet Samuel goes and seeks um, David to anoint him and the idea is that he is different than his brothers Man. he's protected by God he has a different dynamic a different element to his life and listen church Christian this morning this is exactly what you want in your walk with God in your life is that you have to have this dynamic of being set apart from God this word holiness that many people use in Christianity, the word holy simply means to be set apart for God. You know, the illustration I like to give or the analogy is simply that whenever you use a vessel like a cup so that you can drink water, you want something that's clean. Amen. So what you do is when you wash dishes is you separate the clean for the dirty, I mean from the dirty. But the idea is that you can pick from the clean ones and not the dirty ones. Can you imagine how hard it would be to drink a cup of water if you had it all mixed in there? Amen. Grab a cup and you see, see in there's macaroni. <laughs> so some, something, this one isn't clean. You begin to, and somewhere, listen, it's being separate from what's dirty and what's unclean. That's the idea of holiness in, uh, in sanctification and anointing is that somewhere you are separated for the use of God. Amen. So how do we do that? How do we get God involved? How, how is it that, you know what, it, it's simple, just, just you know, Pastor, how, how do we do this? How do we get God involved? How do we get God into our match? How do I make my life a handicap match? Well, I want to give you some, some tips tonight, this morning, you know, um, by trusting, one of the ones, one of the tips is trusting in the power of prayer. How many of you guys know that there's power in prayer? Amen. Amen. Prayer is literally asking a spiritual God to get involved in your physical life. Amen. Matthew 18, um, 18 says, Assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Think about those dynamics. On earth and in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Heaven, earth. Amen. Verse 19, again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. It's literally, you ask your God in heaven to get involved in your life on earth. Amen. You're saying, God, please help my finances. You ever pray that? You're asking a spiritual God to touch your physical money. God, please help my wife. Or God, please help my children. Please help my church. What you're doing is you're asking a supernatural spiritual God to get involved in your physical life. It is a handicap match. The moment you begin to give yourself up to prayer is the moment your match becomes handicapped. This is why it's so hard to pray. This is why Satan 
tries to, anything to keep you away from prayer. This is why there's so many, so many distractions in this world. You know, you begin to see the smartphones and all the Hollywood and all these things you have binge watching now that you can go on and watch the whole 28 seasons of Friends in one in one sitting. Distracted. Notifications. I hate notifications. <laughs> I have two. I have ESPN and my messages. <laughs> so my notifications. And then somewhere these people just you know, Facebook and, and, and all these uh, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and all these things that they that all and the excuse they use, I just want to keep up with everything. Well, you don't have to keep up with everything. Come on. Just don't. You can you can read, you can do all these different things. Listen, the, the world isn't gonna fall apart because you don't know what's going on. Amen. You have to trust in the power of prayer. That's what you should be keeping up with, is your God. Amen. That's one. Power of prayer. Two is trusting in his word. You can't just read the Bible. You have to apply it to your life. This is what James says. He says that there's a man that looks in, in a mirror, he says, and looks at his imperfections, but just walks away and doesn't do anything about it. This is like a man who reads the Bible and gets dealt with when he reads the Word of God, but doesn't do anything about it. What good is that? If you don't apply the Word of God, what good is it that you can read? And you know, people, it's funny because you people will select, you know how people have selective hearing? <laughs> people do that with the Bible I'll read the Bible every morning and it's always like Psalms chapter 1 <laughs> or it's like your, God will give you the, inherit, the, the nations as an inheritance the Bible, read the book of Romans see how you feel after you read that one see the only way to understand God is through his word you begin to seek his heart and begin to see what, what's important to him and what do, I, what do I have to do to be right with him and be in, in good standings and a good re relationship with God? See, the Bible has answers to your problems, amen? Yeah. Yeah. Repeat that one more time. The Bible has answers to your problems. Amen. And somewhere we forget that somewhere that we can, when we're going through something, we can open the word of God and figure this out. You can do that. That you can open your word and, and somewhere you can find, you know what, the clarity and the guidance that you need from God. You have to trust his judgment. You know, one of the hardest things I'm going to be preaching tonight out of the Matthew series that we've been doing, Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to speak about pruning and winnowing. And that's one of the hardest things to go through as a Christian is when God says no. It's when God says no that the, you just you can't get involved in that. Your son and daughter of God. You ever, you ever seen children want to do something real bad and the parents says no? Please. No. Come on. No. Please. That's one of the hardest things. Pastor Campbell says that um, you don't know what's really in a man until you tell him no. You have to trust his word. Not only trust the good stuff, but trust his judgments. Trust, trust the the uh, the stuff that he's the yes and the no's in, in the Bible. And the last one is that if, if you want, you have to get God involved in your life. He wants to fight your fight. He wants to fight your fight. Man, see when you get this revelation, life is so much easier. That's somewhere you're saying, listen, I don't have to go through this. I can just drop it. I can just give it to God, and God can help me with it. You know, many, many people that worry and they go crazy with all the problems in their life. And, you know, and you begin to connect the dots and you begin to think if this doesn't happen, that this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And this, and you always come to the conclusion, well, I'm going to die. You know, and all these different things. Listen, it's just, the Bible says, come, come ye who are heavy laden, who are tired. It says, come and take my yoke, which is light. In other words, listen, I've said this before. You are not designed to carry the weight of light. That's not how you were created. Amen. You just weren't. God, God created you so that you can run to Him. Amen. So that you can go to Him with all your issues and all your problems. Amen. That's how God created you. So that you can come to Him so that He can fight your fights. You know, Apostle Paul, he's not saying you're going to have to become a spirit and fight spirits. That's not, that's not what he's saying. You know what's the, you got, you got to read context and read between the lines and hear, you know what Apostle Paul is really telling the Ephesians? Is that somewhere, listen, if you get God involved, he'll fight your fight. Is that this isn't about you. It's about the glory of God. Amen. This is the defeat right here. Is that somewhere you surrender to God and you allow God to help you. 
And listen, your fight won't be won. But see, many people are fighting the fight, the wrong fight. They're fighting it the wrong way. They're punching the wrong person. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Powers against the rulers of darkness of this age. And note that the next scripture doesn't say, so you're going to have to do this. And you're gonna, it says, no, you just put on the whole armor of who? So that's what you have to put on. Not your armor. Anybody else? This is what you do. You put the whole armor of God and God will help you. Amen. There's got to be an, is a standard here. Let's just settle, settle it for the Potter's House Christian Church of Tri-Cities. Amen? Amen? You're not good enough. You're just not. You're not good enough in life to be able to defeat all the attacks from hell. You just It's a whole different spiritual realm. But you serve a God who is good enough. Amen. Amen. You serve a God who says, I'll fight your fight. And this is what you constantly see throughout the Old Testament. That, that when the Israelites try to do it themselves, they will, they will lose things and they will lose these battles. But when they were able to trust God and all the instructions that he gave them, somewhere God supernaturally came through for them. You serve a supernatural God. Amen. So you need to surrender to him and say, you know what, God, fight my fight. Make your match a handicap match. To me, guys, you're, you're in a headlock right now by Satan. He's, 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 he's been doing the people elbow on you the whole, this whole time. Anyway, that's wrestling talk. <laughs> Somewhere you have to say, you know, God, protect, tag his hand and say, God, you get involved this time. I'm tired. I surrender. You get involved. You have to learn how to wrestle. If not, you're going to be all frustrated and vexed in life. This Christian, this Christian thing doesn't work. It does. It does when you when you do what God tells you to do, and it works. But when you try to serve God in your conditions, it does not work. It doesn't work that way. Can I get every head bowed and every eye closed?